In this week's weekly funny story jokes, we bring you our best funny story joke compilation of the week. These story jokes are sure to make you laugh, from the first one to the last one. These are our story jokes which we love to generate. This week we bring you six story jokes, starting with a story about a pig farmer, until we finish with a hilarious story about a lazy husband. Please watch to the end, as we keep the best one for last. So, sit back, get the popcorn, and get ready to laugh until your stomach ache. In our first joke of the day, we bring you Mr. Fitzwilliams from the Department of Absurd Regulations, visiting a pig farm. Hilarious. Today's funny story is all about Orville, the hog father Thompson, a man with a pig farm so legendary, it attracted the attention of some, shall we say, peculiar government officials from the DR, or better known as the Department of Absurd Regulation. Let's see how Orville handled their scrutiny. Orville, the hog father. Thompson was a man who understood pigs. He wasn't your average farmer, no sir. Orville could talk to those pink powerhouses like they were barnyard philosophers. Now, pigs, as history tells us, are descendants of wild boars, ferocious beasts that roamed the Eurasian continent thousands of years ago. Fearsome fighters they were, but Orville saw their potential beyond tusks and temper tantrums. He saw gourmets, discerning connoisseurs of the finest slop. One sunny afternoon, a crisp government suit named Agent Fitzwilliam from the Department of Absurd Regulations arrived at Orville's farm. Fitzwilliam, looking like a man allergic to fresh air, adjusted his tie and peered at the mud-caked pigs with disdain. Mr. Thompson, we've received reports of unsanctioned dietary practices at your farm. Orville, a man with a sun-baked face and a twinkle in his eye, chuckled. Dietary practices, huh? Those hogs just like a little variety in their meals, wouldn't you say, boys? A chorus of enthusiastic snorts echoed his statement. One particularly rotund pig, Wilbur, known for his sophisticated palate, oinked in agreement. Fitzwilliam, however, wasn't convinced. Variety, Mr. Thompson? We have reports of leftover pizza, donut holes, even the occasional expired jar of pickles. Orville scratched his chin. Well, you can't blame a pig for having adventurous taste buds, can you? Fitzwilliam puffed up like a deflated balloon. Mr. Thompson, this is clearly animal cruelty. These creatures need a balanced diet. I'm afraid a $10,000 fine is in order. Orville sighed theatrically. All right, all right. Don't you government folks just love your paperwork? Tell you what, why don't you come back tomorrow and see how I really treat my pigs? Intrigued and slightly terrified, Fitzwilliam returned the next day. This time, he was greeted by a sight that made his monocle pop out. Orville stood in a makeshift gourmet market, surrounded by his pigs. He was holding a can of caviar, a voice that could rival a used car salesman booming from a microphone. All right, folks, listen up. Today's special is beluga caviar, flown in fresh from the Caspian Sea, packed with protein and omega-3s guaranteed to make your snout sing. The pigs, adorned in tiny chef's hats, squealed and oinked with excitement. Wilbur, ever the food critic, sniffed the caviar with an air of disdain. Fitzwilliam was speechless. Mr. Thompson, caviar for pigs. This is even worse than the pizza. They'll get indigestion. Fitzwilliam almost fainted. Orville simply chuckled, patting Wilbur's head. Another $10,000 fine for you, Mr. Thompson. Now Fitzwilliam was angry. Mr. Thompson, knowing that he has a huge problem on his hands, we're going to have a difficult night. The next morning, early Mr. Fitzwilliams from the Department of Absurd Regulation was ready for his last and final inspection. Mr. Thompson came out of his house with a grin on his face and escorted Mr. Fitzwilliams to the pig pen. Now show me what food you have given your pigs that is applicable for them. Mr. Thompson called all the pigs together. They looked very happy. Now where is their food? Mr. Fitzwilliams asked. It has all been consumed. I gave my pigs each $30 to go into town to buy their own food.
Now we will bring you a joke about a very lazy husband and his clever wife. In today's uproarious funny story tale of home improvement hijinks, join us as a newlywed couple embarks on their journey into domestic, well, let's just say bliss is a word we'll use loosely. Picture this, a charming little house that could be straight out of a fairy tale, except with a mischievous streak that would make even a Disney villain blush. From leaky pipes with a mind of their own, to cars that choose the most inconvenient moments to throw a tantrum, their escapades will have you chuckling in disbelief. So, prepare yourselves for an extravagant odyssey of household mayhem, where every day is an epic quest for sanity, and duct tape becomes the ultimate weapon of choice. This is a story of love, laughter, and a whole lot of, honey, can you fix this? Stay tuned for the punchline that'll leave you roaring with laughter. A newlywed couple moves into their charming new house. One day, the husband comes home from work, tired but happy to see his wife. As he hangs up his coat, his wife says, Honey, you know, in the upstairs bathroom, one of the pipes is leaking. Could you fix it? The husband, looking puzzled, replies, What do I look like? Mr. Plumber! The husband just plopped on the couch, a blissful smile plastered on his face, as if he'd just won the lottery. His wife's plumbing request went whooshing past his ears like a leaky faucet joke in a silent movie. He looked as content as a cat in a sunbeam, utterly oblivious to the impending domestic disaster. A few days go by, and the husband comes home from work again, whistling a happy tune. This time, his wife meets him at the door with a concerned expression, holding a car manual like it was a cryptic ancient scroll. Honey, the car won't start. I think it needs a new battery. Could you change it for me? The husband, even more perplexed, responds, What do I look like, Mr. Mechanic? The husband, impervious to her pleas, simply plopped back on the couch, relaxed as a beach bum, kicking off his shoes like he was setting up for a beachside siesta. He grabbed the remote, turned on a nature documentary, and sank into the cushions with the kind of contentment usually reserved for cats and sunbeams. His wife's chore list might as well have been yesterday's news, lost in the junk mail pile. She might have been reciting the Gettysburg Address for all the attention he paid. He was too busy mentally redecorating. In his mind's eye, the leaky faucet wasn't a problem, but a feature. He imagined it as a mini indoor water fountain, adding a touch of zen to their home. The dripping sound? Pure ambiance, like a high-priced spa. Another few days go by, and it's raining heavily. The wife discovers a leak in the roof. She says, Honey, there's a leak on the roof. Can you fix it, please? The husband, by now used to these requests, replies, What do I look like? Bob Vila? The husband, oblivious as a sloth on a Sunday, slumped back onto the couch, whistling a merry tune. The house could have been auditioning for a demolition derby, but his only concern seemed to be the perfect nap angle. Wife, meanwhile, was already strategizing. This leaky roof, creaky floor, and her husband? Nope, she could handle a whole house falling apart. This man, however, was clearly optional. The next day, the husband comes home to a surprising sight. The roof is fixed, the plumbing is in perfect condition, and the car is purring like a kitten. He asks his wife what happened. Oh, I had a handyman come in and fix them. The woman said casually. Great! How much is that going to cost me? He snarls, bracing himself for a hefty bill. The wife replied. Nothing. He said he'd do it for free if I either baked him a cake or slept with him. Uh, well, what kind of cake did you make? Asks the husband, a hint of worry in his voice. The wife replied. Oh no, honey. What do I look like? A baker? <laughs> In our next joke, we will bring you a grandfather, wanting to impress his grandchildren and a big mouse mistake. In today's story joke, an unexpected visitor and a perplexed devil set the stage for a wild and hilarious tale. Picture this, the devil, Engrossed in the Codex Gigas, the legendary Devil's Bible, 
is stumped by a missing data file. What follows is a chaotic adventure involving giant mice, panicked grandchildren, and a twist you won't see coming. Stay tuned for this hilarity. Believe me, you wouldn't want to miss it. An old man suddenly arrived in a burst of flames, looking confused and lost. The devil, busy flipping through the Codex Gigas, the largest extant medieval illuminated manuscript known as the Devil's Bible, frowned. He was unable to find this old man's data file. This can't be right, the old man grumbled, looking at the devil. I've been a good man my whole life. The devil nodded apologetically. Most people said this when they arrived at hell. Why don't you start with how you died and we'll figure it out, he suggested. The old man sighed and began, Well, I was out with my grandchildren, enjoying a fun day out. I don't get the grandchildren often because my eyesight is starting to fade. But we were having the most wonderful time. Go on, the devil said, glancing at the full-page portrait of himself in the Codex Gigas. Legend has it that this manuscript, created in the early 13th century, was completed overnight with the help of the devil himself. But I needed to keep going. You see, with mice, you need to see their guts to know they're dead. Otherwise, they'll be back with others. So you killed it? The devil asked. Some of his demigods had come to listen to the story, curious about the unfolding drama. By golly, I did. Guts and all were splattered for all to see. The kids had lost their minds at this point. Tears everywhere. A crowd had gathered as well, all screaming at the sight. It was at this point, though, that the exertion caught up with me. I felt my heart give way. I must have suffered a heart attack. Next thing I know, I'm here. Well, the devil said, concerned, this doesn't seem to add up. Let me just give heaven a call, and we'll try to see what's going on here. The devil pulled a phone from thin air and dialed a number. Hey, St. Peter, bro, the devil said. I think I've got one of yours here. His story checks out. Must have been a mix-up. The devil nodded as a voice on the phone spoke back to him. He gave the old man a silent celebratory thumbs up as the voice continued. The devil covered the phone speaker with his hand, turned to the old man and said, You're all good. They just want to know where you were when you died. The place which you remember the last time before you landed at my gate. The old man nodded. Oh, that's easy. I was at Disneyland. <laughs> in our fourth funny story of the day, we bring you two friends that have to go and identify their friend Patty at the morgue. In today's side-splitting saga, prepare to embark on a journey where reality takes a detour down the winding road of absurdity. Patty's misfortune sets the stage for a rib-tickling escapade that'll have you questioning if you've stumbled into a comedy sketch by accident. So fasten your seatbelts, folks, because this joke is about to whisk you away on a whirlwind of hilarity. Stay tuned. Patty, bless his charred soul, found himself in quite the predicament after meeting an untimely demise in a fiery blaze. Now, imagine the scene. Flames dancing, smoke billowing, and poor Patty left roasted to a crisp. It was the kind of situation that would have made even the most seasoned mortician break into a cold sweat. Enter the morgue, that eerie sanctuary where human remains are stored like frozen dinners, waiting for their turn to meet their maker. In modern times, these macabre establishments have upgraded their facilities to include refrigeration units, ensuring that corpses stay fresh longer than your last grocery haul. Now, as fate would have it, Patty's two best pals, Seamus and Sean, were tasked with the unenviable job of identifying their dear friend's charred remains. Armed with a morbid curiosity and perhaps a hint of trepidation, they stepped into the morgue, ready to confront the grim reality of Patty's demise. Seamus, always the brave soul, took the lead as the mortician, a seasoned veteran in the art of anatomical pathology, revealed Patty's charred form beneath the cold, sterile sheet. Seamus remarked with a grimace. Yup, he's burnt pretty bad. Roll him over. 
Now let's pause for a moment to appreciate the etymology of our morbid fascination. The term mortuary traces its roots back to medieval times, originating from the Anglo-French word mortuary, which referred to a gift from a deceased parishioner to their local priest. Meanwhile, morgue has French origins, once describing a section of a prison reserved for newly arrived inmates. As Seamus and the mortician turned poor Patty's body, a sense of dread lingered in the air like the faint scent of formaldehyde. But alas, Seamus shook his head in disbelief. Nope, it ain't Patty, he declared, leaving the mortician scratching his head in confusion. Undeterred by his friend's puzzling proclamation, Sean stepped up to the plate, ready to lend his discerning eye to the task at hand. With a mixture of solemnity and gallows humor, Sean assessed the charred figure before him. Yep, he's burnt really bad. But as Sean examined the remains more closely and rolled him over, a realization dawned upon him like a bolt of lightning on a stormy night. No, it ain't Patty. He announced, his voice tinged with a hint of amusement. Perplexed beyond measure, the mortician couldn't help but inquire. How can you tell? And in that moment, Sean delivered the punchline with the finesse of a seasoned stand-up comedian. Well, Patty had two arseholes. He proclaimed with unwavering confidence, leaving the mortician utterly flabbergasted. What, he had two arseholes? The mortician exclaimed, his mind reeling with disbelief. Sean replied, a mischievous twinkle in his eye. Yep, everyone knew he had two arseholes. Every time we went into town, folks would say, here comes Patty with them two arseholes. In our second last funny story of the day, this guy gets stuck next to the road at night when a ghost car appears. Very funny. In today's funny story joke, we meet Bill, a man facing a dark night, a fierce rainstorm, and perhaps even darker thoughts about life's mysteries. As he stands there, soaked and shivering, he contemplates the afterlife. Yes, that's right. We're diving deep into the existential pool from the get-go. According to various belief systems, our consciousness might just continue after our physical form bites the dust. But hold on to your umbrellas, folks, because Bill's night is about to take a turn for the absurd. Bill was on the side of the road hitchhiking on a very dark night in the midst of a fierce rainstorm. The night was rolling on and no car went by. The storm was so strong he could hardly see a few meters ahead of him. As he stood there, soaked and shivering, he began to ponder life's great mysteries, particularly the concept of the afterlife or life after death. According to various belief systems, the essential part of an individual's consciousness or identity continues to exist after the death of their physical body. In some views, this continued existence takes place in a spiritual realm, while in others, the individual may be reborn into this world beginning the life cycle over again through reincarnation. Suddenly, through the swirling rain, Bill saw a car slowly coming towards him. As it drew level with him, it stopped. Desperate for shelter and without really thinking about what he was doing, Bill got into the back seat of the car and closed the door. That was when he realized there was nobody behind the wheel and the engine wasn't even on. Mysteriously and soundlessly, the car started moving slowly forward. Bill looked at the road and saw a curve approaching. Now he was scared and began to fear for his life. Just before he reached the curve, a ghostly hand appeared through the window of the car and turned the steering wheel. This eerie sight made him think of the 1990 film Ghost, where the protagonist, played by Patrick Swayze, navigates the afterlife as a spirit on Earth to protect his beloved girlfriend and solve the mystery of his murder. Sam's spirit world interactions in the film illustrated a form of spiritual continuation where his essence remained active, much like the ghostly hand that was now steering the car. Bill, paralyzed with terror, watched how the hand appeared every time they came to a curve. The experience reminded him of various religious beliefs where spirits linger to complete unfinished business, reflecting both the emotional and metaphysical aspects of life after death. 
Bill's mind raced through different afterlife concepts, heaven, hell, reincarnation, and now, apparently, ghost chauffeurs. When he saw the lights of a pub down the road, Bill gathered all his bravery and strength, jumped out of the car, and ran to the pub. Wet and out of breath, he burst through the doors like a man possessed and shouted, I need two shots of scotch, pronto. The bartender, seeing the wild look in Bill's eyes, obliged without question. Shaking and half crying, Bill began telling everybody about the horrible experience he had just been through. A silence enveloped everybody when they realized he was not drunk, but was for real. One old timer in the corner, who had seen his fair share of strange things, muttered, I've heard of ghost stories, but this is something else. About 10 minutes later, two guys walked into the same pub. They were also wet and out of breath, looking like they had run a marathon through a car wash. Seeing Bill sobbing at the bar, one said to the other, Hey Bruce, isn't that the idiot who got in the car while we were pushing it? <laughs> in our last funny story of the day, we bring you a cake mishap at a church bazaar. Like promised, we left the best for last. But before we get going on our last story, I would like to thank you for watching our creations. If you liked it, then please press the subscribe button and the bell icon underneath this video, and you will be notified when our next videos become live. Okay, folks, here goes with our last story of the day. In today's funny story joke, we're about to dive into a tale brimming with twists, historical quirks, and a plot twist that will leave you in stitches. Imagine a Victorian charity bazaar, a determined baker, and a cake with a secret so shocking it could make a bishop choke on his tea. What could possibly go wrong? Buckle up, because this one's a roller coaster you won't want to miss. Imagine Victorian England, a land where fainting couches were a must-have furniture item and gossip traveled faster than a handsome cab on a cobblestone street. Back then, raising money wasn't some flashy telethon with a sweaty man in a headset begging you to call a 1-800 number. Oh no, it was a delightful absurdity called a charity bazaar or fancy fair if you were feeling particularly posh. Think of it as a gossip convention crashing head-on with an arts and crafts market with a healthy dose of questionable homemade goods like crocheted teapot cozies that wouldn't keep a teacup warm for a penguin in the Arctic. Critics, bless their perpetually furrowed brows, scoffed at these sham products, arguing they stole business from proper shops. But honestly, who could resist a good cause, especially when it involved ladies in bustles the size of hot air balloons showing off their, ahem, unique needlepoint skills? Let's just say some of those embroidered handkerchiefs looked less like delicate flowers and more like psychedelic sea monsters escaped from a sailor's rum-induced nightmare. But hey, that was the charm of the charity bazaar, a delightful blend of philanthropy, questionable crafts, and enough social gossip to fuel a season of Netflix period dramas. In the quaint town of Whitby, nestled by the ever-churning sea, lived Aunt San, a baking legend. Her scones were rumored to cure the vapors, and her pies were so good they could make a vicar reconsider celibacy, though such thoughts were never uttered aloud, of course. But disaster struck the night before the annual church bazaar, like a rogue fog rolling in off the North Sea. Her masterpiece, a fruitcake destined to be the centerpiece of the event, decided to impersonate a pancake. Time was flatter than the cake itself, and Aunt San, resourceful as any Victorian lady, hatched a plan as ingenious as it was likely to land her in social Siberia. Picture this, a majestic cake, a frosted Goliath ready to conquer the taste buds of Whitby. But beneath this sugary facade lurked a secret darker than a chimney sweep's fingernails. Nestled in the center, like a throne fit for a porcelain monarch, was a toilet roll, a royal imposter indeed. A thick layer of icing sugar, applied with the trowel-like grace of a nervous bricklayer, became the imposter king's royal cloak. Aunt San, 
with the confidence of a magician about to pull a live badger out of a top hat, though such a feat would be wildly inappropriate for a church bazaar. Deep down, she knew she might have to resort to buying her own creation back. Because let's be honest, who else in their right mind would spend good money on a pastry that looked like it could give a toilet a complex? The morning of the bazaar dawned, and faster than you can say charity case, Aunt San's cake vanished like a magician's handkerchief, snatched up quicker than a vicar caught eyeing a barmaid's ankle. Panic seized Aunt San tighter than a corset on a particularly large lady who just discovered her favorite gossip was a complete fabrication. Who, in their right mind, had bought this potential pastry-based projectile? The next few hours were an agonizing waiting game, each social interaction a potential landmine of icing-covered shame. Every time someone complimented the luscious fruitcake, Aunt San felt like fainting dead away, a prospect that would have only caused more suspicion given the current state of her baked goods. The following day, fate would have its delicious way with Aunt San. She found herself at tea with her dear friend Clara. As the tea tray arrived, Aunt San felt her composure crumble faster than a custard tart at a picnic. There it sat, in all its glory, or lack thereof, the cake, the toilet roll throne, and all. But before she could confess her bakery blunder, Clara, bless her unsuspecting soul, beamed and declared, Aunt San, time to enjoy the cake. I slaved two days over. <laughs> if you liked our joke, then please watch our next joke by clicking here.